Daniel 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then King Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. And these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace." Before the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down into the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men, unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning, fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And... The satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their he heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has set his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command, and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks 
anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are grateful for this story and what it communicates to us about you and what you require of us. We pray that this would be used to strengthen your people, that it would be used as it is preached to save sinners, to bring people into your kingdom, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your marvelous light, of your Son, Jesus Christ. Teach us this morning to honor our Lord Jesus because he is worth it, and I pray, Father, that you would anoint the hearing and preaching of your word in Christ's name. Amen. There's a lot of repetition in that chapter. And we are in the book of Daniel, and I hope you noticed that as I read the chapter, all of the repetition that was in it. And last week, we examined Nebuchadnezzar's dream of Daniel chapter 2. So we're beyond Nebuchadnezzar's dream of Daniel chapter 2. And we learned last week that King Jesus who will grind into powder the godless kingdoms of this world if they don't repent. The heathen kingdoms of this world, the ungodly, unchristian kingdoms of this world, Jesus, our Savior, will grind them into powder if they don't receive him as king. The kingdom of Christ, therefore, is greater than all earthly kingdoms. I hope you understand that. The kingdom of Christ is greater than all earthly kingdoms because its power is from heaven, not earth. The kingdom of Christ is greater than all earthly kingdoms because it will cover the earth. It's not limited geographically. The kingdom of Christ is greater than all earthly kingdoms because it will last forever. It's not temporary. The kingdom of Christ is greater than all earthly kingdoms because it has been purchased by the blood of the God-man, who is ruler of kings and revealer of mysteries. The kingdom of Christ is greater than all earthly kingdoms. We saw that in Daniel chapter 2 with Nebuchadnezzar's vision of the many kingdoms that are then destroyed by King Jesus. Despite what your senses tell you, and your senses may indicate some things and certain things, despite what they tell you, the king of the kingdom of Christ, King Jesus and his kingdom will triumph. And last chapter closed, or last week's chapter closed with a message of hope. Nebuchadnezzar acknowledging that the kingdom of Christ is the greatest of all kingdoms by falling on his face before Daniel and declaring just that, confessing verbally the supremacy of God and of God's kingdom. This week, we turn to Daniel chapter 3, and it seems to me that Nebuchadnezzar, while well, last week fell on his face before Daniel and declared the superiority and the supremacy of God's kingdom, this week we get to Daniel chapter 3, and it seems that Nebuchadnezzar has some buyer's remorse. He's vacillating. And so we're questioning how genuine his profession of faith was as he now vacillates and seems to go back against the acknowledgement that he made in the, pre in the previous week and still... Just as the case was with Pharaoh. You remember what Pharaoh did? He did the same thing. He vacillated. God sends a warning. Pharaoh vacillates. He makes a promise. He vacillates. God sends a warning. Pharaoh makes a promise and vacillates. And this is what's happening in the book of Daniel. God sends warnings, and what happens is King Nebuchadnezzar vacillates. He acknowledges the supremacy of Christ, and then he vacillates. He, he's, a, he's a wet noodle type of guy, and we see that he's very weak, and he's very easily moved by his senses and by his emotions. He's a vacillating, weak man, and very similar to Pharaoh. And so that parallels nicely for us as we go through the book of Daniel, and we see patterns. We detect patterns of how God deals with the rulers of this world. He sends warnings, they back off, and then they vacillate. He sends warnings, they back off, and then they vacillate. And then what happens eventually is God's patience expires, and they're ground to powder. Well, anyway, King Nebuchadnezzar has buyer's remorse. And having buyer's remorse now, he builds a giant golden statue of himself. And he calls not just the people of his nation, but all peoples of all nations to bow down and worship this giant golden statue of himself. 
This week he calls them to worship, and interestingly, in Daniel chapter 3, Daniel isn't featured. We don't hear about Daniel. We don't know where Daniel is at this point. We can hypothesize a little bit about where he is, and maybe I will later on in the sermon, but it is somewhat of a mystery as to where Daniel stands at this particular point in time. Daniel isn't featured in this story from the royal court, but his three friends are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, provoke a crisis in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom because they're magistrates also. Daniel has been raised to the level of almost prime minister of the land under Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel's three friends seem to be Daniel's cabinet at this point in time. And so they are high-level magistrates, and Daniel is a high-level magistrate, and these three friends who are high up in the royal court provoke a crisis. And they provoke a crisis within government because they refuse the orders to bow down. Nebuchadnezzar then throws them into a fiery furnace in an attempt to kill them, but God rescues them. In this story, we learn a number of lessons. We learn, I think, predominantly, there'll be a number of applications that come out, and I'll try and summarize some very key applications at the end of the sermon. But if I want to summarize the application and what we learn in one sentence, we learn that when men put themselves in the place of God, God will ensure that God is honored. A ruler especially, God's appointed government, And when government puts itself in the place of God, God ensures that God himself is honored. He will not tolerate forever those who put themselves in the place of God. Nebuchadnezzar essentially establishes himself as an antichrist in this passage. And as an antichrist, he puts himself in the place of Christ. And he desires to have what only Christ is entitled to. And what we learn is that God will not have it. God himself will ensure that he himself is honored and rulers who do such things are humbled and brought low. Let me outline the text this morning with four headings. And what we'll see is that this is a rescue mission. Is We begin with Nebuchadnezzar putting himself in God's place and we end with God receiving his honor. So it's... It's Nebuchadnezzar putting himself in God's place. That's where it starts. Nebuchadnezzar's looking for the honor that God deserves. And then it ends with God receiving his honor, God receiving God's honor. So number one, Nebuchadnezzar puts himself in God's place. Number two, Nebuchadnezzar demands that dissenters, those who dissent from his orders, be executed. Number three, God protects the dissenters. And number four, God receives his honor. It goes from Nebuchadnezzar looking for God's honor upon Nebuchadnezzar, then God taking his honor back from Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar tries to take God's honor. God takes his own honor. This is how the passage goes. It's a bit of a rescue mission. And in the middle of it, Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are rescued. Let's look at the first point this morning. The first heading, and that is Nebuchadnezzar puts himself in God's place. This is the challenge as things are set up for us. Verse 1, he builds a massive statue, or image of himself at least, not necessarily a statue, but an image. And the image is 90 feet by 9 feet. 9 feet wide and 90 feet tall, and so that's about, if you think about 90 feet, if you look at two, if you look at one tractor trailer on the highway and then multiply that by two, that's, you know, give or take about 90 feet. So that's, that's 90 feet, just around two tractor trailers on the highway. It's likely, I don't think it's a statue, given some of the artwork that's been unearthed in the ancient Near East. I think it's what you call an obelisk, which was essentially a square block that was set up 90 by 9, and within the square block was an engraving of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, 
So I think that's likely what it was. But either way, it is plated at least with gold. We don't know if it's solid gold, but at least it's plated with gold. And as you consider this statue, it's, the statue is set up outside of the Babylon proper. It's set up in, a, in the plain of Dura. We don't know where that is. There's many places in ancient Babylon apparently called Dura. But it's some, somewhere outside of city limits in a field where you can gather mass amounts of people. And this golden obelisk with a picture, an engraving of Nebuchadnezzar on it is set up. And you remember early in Daniel, what happened to the temple in Jerusalem? Is the Babylonians raided the Jerusalem temple and took the precious metals out of the Jerusalem temple. So the question that may be in your mind as you look at this, think of this golden statue or a golden obelisk that's set up out just outside of Babylon proper, outside of city limits for people to worship and bow down to, where do they get the gold from? And I think it's likely that they stole the, some of the gold, at least, from Jerusalem, and now they're using God's gold to commit second commandment violations. So they've taken God's gold, and they've set up um, this gaudy idol that the people need to bow down and worship to. They're using God's gold in a way that it was not intended to be used. And this statue that is 90 feet by 9 is probably also being borrowed from Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So if you remember, last week, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the golden head of the statue went to a silver chest and silver arms, then went to a bronze stomach and bronze thighs, and then went to iron legs and then iron and clay feet. And this statue, the head of the statue last week was a golden head, and that was representative of, of Nebuchadnezzar. So it's very possible, and I think the inference is, is that Nebuchadnezzar, yes, he bowed down and acknowledged God Almighty, and he acknowledged how great God Almighty is, but I think it's likely that this vision of God somehow went to his head, and then he thought, well, I'm going to construct a, an image of myself because I am so wonderful, and I'm the golden head of the kingdoms. And so I'll build a statue commemorating the fact that I'm the golden head. And then he, we don't know how long, how much time took place between Daniel 2 and Daniel 3, but he's, he seems to be twisting the revelation of God in a way that brings honor and glory to himself as opposed to that brings honor and glory to God. And this is the way people are, aren't they? Unregenerate people, what they do is they'll get a few passages of Scripture, they'll twist them and they'll manipulate them, and they'll make them sound like, in a way that they, they want them to sound. And this, by the way, is, is precisely what, our, what many churches and certainly governments have done over the these last few years, is they'll get a few Bible verses, and instead of using those Bible verses properly, they'll manipulate them in a way that makes us, at least attempts to seduce us into acts that are sinful that show that the government is more loyal than, or that we're more loyal to the government than to God. And you can think of this in a number of ways, Romans 13 being one of them, or love your neighbor being another one. Over the, other, over the years, judge not lest you be judged being another one. And these are all passages, or turn the other cheek is another one. These are all passages that people have used and they've manipulated to bring about ungodly levels of compliance towards the people of God. And, and we, hear, we have that here. Nebuchadnezzar is manipulating the revelation of God. He, after all, is the golden head on the statue and the vision that God gave him. Without understanding that that vision was meant to humble him, he now uses that vision in an attempt to bring himself glory. So he gathers all the magistrates to worship the image of himself. These are all the government officials. And what I want you to do is I want you to notice the cadence and the rhythm in this. Verse 2, then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather, now listen to the cadence and the rhythm, the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and the officials of the province. There's a bit of a cadence and a rhythm there. Or verse 3, then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gather. There's a cadence, and there's a rhythm. It's almost 
hypnotizing in its repetitiveness. And what's happening is that these folks, the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the government are being put under a spell. There's a, they're, they're being put under a spell. They're being manipulated and they're becoming spellbound. And then you see it again, I think, in verse 5, where you hear about the different instruments. Verse 5 says that when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, you fall down. And so what do we have here? We have a cadence. We have a rhythm. And then in verse 7, we have something similar. Therefore, as soon as all the people heard the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples fell down. And this is a hypnotizing effect that I think is subtly indicating to us that these people, this is what some people would call mass psychosis. They're being put under a spell so that they don't even know what's going on. And they're just all kind of moving like a bunch of lemmings over the cliff. This is likely, as you think about all these instruments together, this is likely not a sophisticated orchestra. This is likely not beautiful music, like the classical music that you might hear, but this is something that is unsophisticated, sophisticated and emotive. It's designed to provoke the emotions of the simple-minded and cast them under an emotional spell, to bring them into this enchanted ritual where they are literally being led by a Pied Piper to commit Second Commandment violations by bowing down to an idol. Matthew Poole comments on this and this use of music and repetition and the hypnosis that's going on here. And he says, this is one of Satan's great engines to draw the world from God's pure worship and the simplicity that is in Christ, dazzling men's eyes and bewitching them with a gaudy, whorish dress of idolatrous service. Speaking of worship service. And this is, by the way, what characterizes Eastern religions. This is an Eastern idolatrous religion. This is what characterizes them. Goddishness or gaudiness. Um, bewitching uses of music. Something that distracts from the simplicity of the pure worship of Jesus Christ. Designed to pull on the emotions so that you are not worshiping God with your heart and your head. But you're worshiping God with your stomach with your senses. And this is what drives so many Eastern religions. And by the way, this is why Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism should be so offensive to biblically-minded people because they're taking the gaudiness of Eastern religions and using them to dazzle men's eyes and senses into worship, all the paintings in front of the church, all the statues, the incense, um, are all attempts to induce the senses. But really, if, if you're going to worship Jesus Christ in purity, you ought to be able to do it in a barn or in a cave or in a field. And all that you need if you want to, you know, the way that God's told us to, to worship, you need a Bible, you need some psalms, you need some wine, some bread, and some water, and then you can have a Christian worship service. These are simple things, but there is a gaudiness that's emphasized here, and I think this is something that we should treasure as a church. And this is a problem with a lot of evangelical churches today. What have they done? Protestant churches. They've tried to use the world's appeal to the senses to appeal people into the church the same way that the king of Babylon is doing here. Let's have smoke. Let's have lights. Let's 
Let's create emotive experiences and essentially draw, attempt to draw people into the worship of Christ by appealing to their stomachs, their senses. And Nebuchadnezzar is doing just that. He's sucking them into an emotional trance. And he takes away, this type of experience takes away from Jesus Christ and the simplicity by which he has commanded himself to be worshipped. Worship. Nebuchadnezzar creates a sensual environment to lead them into the sin of idolatry. And that shouldn't surprise us because what is idolatry? It's sensual. You, you put up a, an image of a false god in front of the congregation and you tell them to bow down to it, you're appealing to the visual senses. And then you create this hypnotic type music, and then you throw some incenses into it. And you have a sensual experience of worship appealing to base level instincts as opposed to teaching people to worship God with their minds and their hearts. You're worship, they're worshiping him with their guts. This is antichrist to the core. Look at verse 4 is this image is being set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, you are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages. What do you recognize in there? Same thing is said in verse 7 at the end of it, or at the beginning of it. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trig, and harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples and languages, or nations and languages fell down. Peoples, languages, nations. Peoples, nations, languages. What's that telling you? What is Jesus. He is the unifier of the peoples, the languages, and the nations. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords. All peoples, languages, and nations will come to him. And so Nebuchadnezzar is antichrist. He is usurping the place of Jesus Christ, and he's presenting himself as the great unifier of peoples, languages, and nations, which is reserved for Christ. And this is why attempts at unified global governments and centralized governments should concern us. Because a Christian understanding of government is that Jesus is the unifier. So that you have different levels of government that don't answer to each other. You have different branches of government that don't answer to each other. And you have different jurisdictions of government that don't answer to each other. And you have different governments over the world that don't answer to each other. And, and, and what it's supposed to present if it, in an ideal world is that Jesus is the unifier of the people. So as they are self-governed by Jesus Christ, they don't need unification by a tyrannical centralized government. And Nebuchadnezzar is replacing self-government under Christ with tyranny under Nebuchadnezzar. He's putting himself in the place of Christ, who is the true ruler of kings. And then he proclaims death to the dissidents, verse 6. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And so what is he doing here? He's now saying, look, if, if you don't work, we know what the Bible says, if you don't bow down to Jesus, you'll be burned in hellfire. Well, Nebuchadnezzar is now putting himself in the place of Jesus. It's not if you don't bow down to Jesus, you'll be burned. It's if you don't bow down to Nebuchadnezzar, he'll kill you and burn you. So again, these are God-like attributes that he's assuming. And he's taking these attributes on himself with his centralized power, with his threat of fire, and his attempt to unify the people in the worship of himself, in allegiance to himself over God. Nebuchadnezzar puts himself in God's place. Number two, Nebuchadnezzar demands that dissenters be executed. I just noted that in verse 6, but we see that again in verse 8 here is there's a couple of rats that come to get these faithful, godly people in trouble. There are dissenters in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. It doesn't seem like there's many of them, but there are a few, whose allegiance is to King Jesus and not Nebuchadnezzar. And there are rats who turn on them. If you look at verse 8, Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. So you got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who are refusing to bow down. And you have a bunch of rats in the Chaldeans who are ratting them out. 
They've, they've established some type of anonymous hotline where you can call the government and rat out your neighbors, and that's what they're doing. And the Chaldeans, by the way, they are, we, they are the wise men of Daniel chapter 2, verse 24. So if you go back to Daniel 2, 2 verse 24, the Chaldeans are wise men, uh, in the kingdom at least, the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. And this is of whom Daniel references in 2, verse 24. Look at what it says in 2, verse 24. This is important to note what's going on here. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men, the Chaldeans, of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. The Chaldeans were among those who couldn't recount Nebuchadnezzar's dream, couldn't interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and the wise men are among those who Daniel saved and advocated for. The Chaldeans are. And so these are people who Daniel literally saved their lives in the previous chapter. And now it seems that they've grown embittered towards the prominence of the Jews in the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. And so they're traitors. And notice what they do. Their sin, what's their sin? Their sin is telling the truth in a disloyal way. It's not like they lied. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not bowing down to the image. They told the truth in a disloyal way. And there's always people who are going to use the truth in a disloyal way to hurt people. There are always people, and, and there's always people, and you'll find in the kingdom of, of God, there are always people who will put a tomahawk. If you're faithful to God's kingdom, there are, there are people who will put a tomahawk in the back of your head, even though you helped and sacrificed for them. And I've found, it's been my experience, if you're around long and you're faithful to God, you will find that there are people who will literally try to destroy you, even though your heart is to help them. And we can't, as Christians, grow bitter towards such people. We must love them and, and care for them, just as our Lord Jesus Christ does. But I've certainly experienced this on several occasions. And for whatever reason, they, they become covetousness and hateful towards the ones who are experiencing God's blessing in this. And they turn around when they're not looking and they put a tomahawk in the back of their heads. And they remind, in verse 9 through 11, Nebuchadnezzar that these dissenters must die. So they go to Nebuchadnezzar in verse 9 and 11. These people are supposed to die, these three Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they tell Nebuchadnezzar that the Jews have dissented and must die in verse 12 of chapter 3, where it says, There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Bab Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. And so what do they want done to him, them? They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. Daniel is absent from this allegation. We don't know why Daniel is absent. My guess is there could be a host of reasons, but my guess is because he's so trusted by Nebuchadnezzar, he's probably back in Babylon proper managing the affairs of the city while Nebuchadnezzar has taken the people out into the plain of Dura. And so it's someone needed to manage government while all the government officials were away, and he was Nebuchadnezzar's right-hand man by this point, so he likely left him back. But there could be other reasons. We can't be too dogmatic about things that aren't there. Nebuchadnezzar shows how unstable he is at this point by breaking into a rage in verse 13. He's a very unstable man. The Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar provides an opportunity for them to recant in verses 14 and 15. Again, he plays the music. When the music's played, he sees if he can induce them to this worship by setting the sense the, the sensories that are, are needed, or at least the sensual experience that is needed, the sensory experience that's needed to draw them into this false worship. And in verse 15, Nebuchadnezzar actually mocks the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the end of the passage, he says, and who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Essentially proclaiming that he himself is greater than God. Nobody can deliver you out of my hands, not even your God. The answer him with clarity and they answer him with courage in verse 16 and 18, where it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, 
Be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now, pay attention to what they said. They said they're, willing, they're not willing to worship this image, but they are willing to die. God could save them. God might not save them. But whatever it is, they're willing to go down in honor. And this could be the hill they have to die on. That's how you and I have to live as Christians. We have to live every opportunity to compromise. Every time we have an opportunity to compromise, we have to live it as an opportunity to lay our lives down for Christ and take up our cross for him. And that's precisely what they did. We should admire this, and we should find great strength in their example. When we are called to compromise our convictions, that is the point in which we are called to die, to take up our cross and follow Jesus. Nebuchadnezzar provides this opportunity to recant. They refuse, and they do so courageously with clarity. And Nebuchadnezzar shows his instability again. Second time he shows his instability here by breaking into another rage in verse 19, where it says that Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed between, again, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. Well, this man is an unstable man. He reacts emotionally. You know, these men are reacting with cool and level heads. What's Nebuchadnezzar doing? He doesn't have a cool and level head. He's an emotional man who is reacting with what? His gut. Not with his head and his heart, but with the senses. He's letting his emotions get the best of him. And this furnace is hot. It's very hot. It was likely a some type of cylindrical furnace with an opening at the top in which he threw the man in. And then there's some type of opening at the bottom which you could sweep the ashes out and you could put more fuel in or use the opening at the bottom to pump oxygen in to the fire so that it would burn hotter. So that's where they were able to see the men at the bottom and they threw the men in at the top. This is a, quite the furnace and it's a large enough furnace for four men to walk around in. So it's huge and it's heated very hot. He has them bound, and he has them thrown into the fire in verse 20, where it says, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the fiery furnace. These men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, their other garments, and they were thrown into the fiery furnace. So their, their hands are tied, feet are tied, thrown in. So they have no hope of standing up. Now, it's important to note at this point that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what have they done this whole time? They've stood. Everybody else has fallen down before the idol. They've stood. Well, Nebuchadnezzar is going to make them fall down, at least he thinks he is, by binding them so they can't stand when they hit the bottom of this furnace. We see again Nebuchadnezzar's character come out. He has a a level of instability, as I've noted already, and not only is he an unstable man, but he is grossly and disgustingly disloyal. Look at verse 22. Because the king's orders was urgent, so there's the urgency, the emotionalism coming out, and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These are Nebuchadnezzar's loyal soldiers. They're doing his bidding. And how does he treat them? He puts their lives in unnecessary danger so that they die in the process. And by the way, what is this doing? That's what Nebuchadnezzar is doing, but what is God doing? Well, God is using this as an opportunity to show how great he is. Because Nebuchadnezzar cannot and will not protect his men from the fire. But God will and does protect his men from the fire. Right? Right? Nebuchadnezzar is an evil, disloyal man who doesn't care about his most faithful servants. If they die, they're expendable. I'll get somebody else. God is a loving, caring father who can and does protect his men in the fire, his most faithful men. He is an, Nebuchadnezzar is an unstable, angry unpredictable man. God is a stable God with a benevolent disposition towards his people. 
And the dissenters here, moving on from that, the dissenters are left to die. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into the fire. Verse 23. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. And so we're left kind of on the edges of our seats here, aren't we? What's going to happen to God's servants? Will they go the way of Nebuchadnezzar's men? Will they perish? What will happen to true worship? Will true worship be bound up and thrown into a fire and die forever? What will happen to the kingdom of God? Will it finally be destroyed and snuffed out by Nebuchadnezzar? What will God do? Will Nebuchadnezzar unify the world under his dominion and overthrow the kingdom of God and the promises of God that we saw in in chapter 2? In chapter 2, God promises that his kingdom will last forever. In chapter 3, it looks like God's kingdom is about to be destroyed at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Will God show himself true? Can God be trusted? Is he worthy of honor? These are the questions that we face. And then we get to our third point this morning. that We find that God protects his dissenters. Nebuchadnezzar is befuddled. So he, with a befuddled look on his face, I suspect, asks a question. Verse 24, the king Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. What is going on here? And rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, the Chaldeans, Do we not, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Yet, verse 25, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, But I see four men. I thought I threw five, three men in there. I see four men in the fire. Walking. I thought they would die in the fire. They were supposed to fall flat on their backs and be burned alive and singed and destroyed. And yet they're still standing in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And mystery of mysteries, the appearance of the fourth, is like a son of the gods. The question is that we should be, we have uh, naturally as we come to this text, is who's this fourth man? Who is this man that is with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire? And to that, I think Isaiah 53 verses 2 and 3 answers our question, which says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba, in exchange for you. Who's with them? It's the same God that was with them as they walked through the desert in the Exodus. It's the same God that was with them as they traversed the Red Sea. It's the same God that was with them as they had to face the opposing armies of Canaan. It's the same God that was with them as they walked across across the River Jordan into the Promised Land. And it's the same God that is with us, who promises us in His great commission, Lo, I am with you always, even into the end of the ages. The second person of the Trinity in his pre-incarnate state stands with them in the fire. Now, I've experienced this to a lesser degree, and I trust you have perhaps. And that is, when suffering for Jesus, personally, I can say this, I have sensed him nearest to me. When suffering for Jesus... I have sensed him nearest to me. And I think we can testify as a congregation that I believe that our sweetest times of worship were sweetest when we did so under the threat of persecution and the law. The most joyful times and the most intimate fellowship you have with Jesus is when you are suffering for Jesus. Now look at, if they hadn't you know, if they hadn't been faithful to God at this point in time, and they, they'd bowed to the statue, they would have never had the experience to walk with the pre-incarnate Christ like this. But because they decide, by God's grace, to honor the Lord and not bow down to the statue and violate the second commandment, and blaspheme God through this violation, 
they now have this sweet experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, our text in verse 25 tells us that they were unbound. Look at They were thrown into the fire what? Bound. Hand and foot. Thrown into the fire bound. What does the fire do? Well, the fire does not hurt them. The fire frees them. God uses what man intended for evil, he uses for good. That fire, which was intended to destroy them, only destroyed their shackles. It freed them so that they are no longer bound. And he does the same with us. He uses the fire of persecution to sanctify us. And he liberates us from the poisonous taste of this world. Just as Daniel's friends, they had the chains burnt off their hands and their feet by this fire that was intended to kill them, but yet they stood up and had fellowship with the pre-incarnate Christ. So we, when we suffer the fire of persecution, that fire frees us from the taste of this world, and we have sweet fellowship with Jesus Christ. This is a beautiful picture of God's presence with his people who suffer with him and for him. Walking, by the way, everyone else in the plains of Dura had bowed to their faces. And these men said, no. So Nebuchadnezzar is going to make them fall on their backs in a fire. And God says, no, my men will stand. And stand they do. In the fires of persecution, it is God Almighty that causes his people to stand. Peter found this out. You can't do it by your own strength. You can't do it by your own will. You can't resist this type of intrusion and tyranny by getting your own self psyched up by a pep talk. You're incapable of it. But by the power of God, his people stand. And they do not bow so that his church walks through the fire. And they have fellowship with God. They are liberated from the tastes of this world and the bondage of sin. And they receive the ability to stand in the face of this level of intrusion and tyranny. Well, in verse 26, Nebuchadnezzar Nebuchadnezzar calls them out. And the best part of him calling them out is that the magistrates who had previously been bespelled get to witness the whole thing in verse 27. So Nebuchadnezzar calls him out in verse 26, calls him out, come out of the fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In verse 27, the previously spellbound magistrates witness it. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads were not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. So look at the people that had been bespelled and hypnotized into this mass act of worship now stand and watch God's men come out of the fire. Do you see what happened? God used... The persecution of the righteous and the stand of the righteous to snap the kingdom out of the spell. God's hand was on these three men. And he used three men. Three men. This is a massive kingdom. The most powerful kingdom that ever existed up until this time. And he used three men to faithfully snap the rest of these people out of the spell that they've been bewitched under. It's a beautiful picture of how God uses the faithfulness of his people. The people that hated them, by the way, and some of them were being rats, putting knives in their backs and so on, and God uses the suffering of his people to snap the entire kingdom, to liberate the entire kingdom. And that's the way it has been historically with the church of Jesus Christ, don't you know? God has used the suffering of his people to liberate the kingdoms of this world from spells, being spellbound to capricious tyrannical, demonically inspired rulers. God will use the suffering of a faithful few 
to do this. The best part, I think, is that the previously bespelled magistrates see it all and wake up from their stupor. We move on. Fourth and final point today. And that is, we began with the very important point that Nebuchadnezzar put himself in God's place. Well, with the fourth point, God puts Nebuchadnezzar in his place, and God receives his honor. Well, Nebuchadnezzar attempted to put Nebuchadnezzar in God's place. God now puts Nebuchadnezzar in Nebuchadnezzar's place, and God receives his honor. Whereas Nebuchadnezzar had previously demanded worship and had previously demanded that he becomes the unifying center of all the people's nations and languages... That is no longer so in verse 28 because Nebuchadnezzar in verse 28 says, answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his angel and delivered his servants. Now, you see angel, you might be tempted to think think that the angel there is not Christ. Well, in in the language of the day, angel could be used to refer to a deity and we see in the book of Genesis that the angel of the Lord does refer to the presence of God. So I still suspect that that fourth person in the furnace was the second person of the Trinity. But moving on, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command. He's actually blessing them for setting aside the king's command. Blessed be you for not obeying me. And yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any God except their own God. So they received the blessing of the king. And now what Nebuchadnezzar does in verse 29 is he understands, at least temporarily, who he is, and he uses his power as the chief magistrate to forbid public blasphemy. Verse 29, Therefore I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. So what does he do? He uses the power of the sword to do good. And what is, he doesn't command worship of the one true God because you can't command worship of the one true God because worship is a thing of the heart, right? But what he does is he forbids blasphemy. And he forbids the blasphemy of the one true God. So, so you imagine if the king makes a decree like this, imagine what's going to happen to the whole land. The whole land, a fear of the Lord is going to settle upon it. Nobody wants to offend the God of Scripture with blasphemy. And Nebuchadnezzar has now been put in his place. So now all the people's nations and languages are not allowed to blaspheme God. Whereas previously Nebuchadnezzar had demanded that all the nations, peoples, and languages um, submit to him and worship his, his idol. So this is the reversal that happens. Previously Nebuchadnezzar put Nebuchadnezzar in God's place. And now God has humbled Nebuchadnezzar and God has put Nebuchadnezzar in Nebuchadnezzar's place. And God now receives the honor that he's due. Whereas he passed a law demanding that the nations unify around him, which is Antichrist, he now forbids the nations from blaspheming Christ. And then in verse 30, the dissenters receive their honor. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. You know what God does? He does. He honors those who honor him. And he does just that here. And all ends well. The story ends well. Let me give a few points of application as we conclude. It's better to die than to commit idol, idolatry. It's better to die than commit idolatry. Christ is worth suffering for, for he shed his blood for us. And the worship of images are, is evil and offensive. And, and this was not... Like Daniel and his friends, you might be tempted to come to this, and you might just say, oh, they were taking a stand for, for freedom. They were part of the freedom movement of ancient Babylon. No. Not like some general broad freedom movement. They were part of the freedom in Christ movement. They simply wanted to do what God commanded them to do. And and that's what liberty is. It's living in the way that, being able to live in the way that God commands you to live. And so this isn't some neutral freedom movement, but this is a movement for the honor and glory of King Jesus. 
in this ancient heathen kingdom whereby true worship is allowed and now blasphemy is forbidden. Furthermore, Christ is with us when we suffer for him. I've already made much of this point, but it's worth repeating. What is done against us is done against our Jesus. By throwing them into the furnace, Nebuchadnezzar threw Christ into the furnace. And the heathen king lost in this great contest because by persecuting Christ's people, Nebuchadnezzar was persecuting Christ. Furthermore, God preserves his people. This should encourage you. This, this absolutely happened. Now, now the true, this is a true story. I believe 100% that Daniel chapter 3 is a true story from the bottom of my heart. But it is a true story that serves as a metaphor of a bigger story. And if you look at Deuteronomy 4 verse 20, it says that Egypt was called the iron furnace in which God's people had to suffer under persecution and tyranny. And the metaphor, the true story, serves as a metaphor of a bigger story. And the bigger story is that God preserves his people in dark times and leads them through the iron furnace. And I think that darkness is covering our land right now. Right now. There is a dark cloud that is getting darker. And I believe this is happening much over the Western world as I speak. And as we enter into this season of darkness, this text tells us that God will preserve his church so that on the other side of the darkness, true religion will emerge. God will resurrect his people in power. God preserves his people. Beyond that, another point of application is that when governments set themselves up in the place of God, God will ensure that he's honored at their expense. Nebuchadnezzar attempted to set himself up in the place of God. And Jesus, God, made sure that he himself, God, was honored at the expense of Nebuchadnezzar. As our governments attempt to set themselves up in the place of God in many different ways that I could list a whole bunch. I've talked about this before. God will ensure when it's all said and done that he will be honored. He will be absolutely honored. And this is not about resistance per se. This is not about being dissidents. This is simply about honoring God and seeing that he's brought honor. And through that, freedom comes as we see in the fire here. And beyond that, I think as we look at the book of Daniel, we should read the world like we read Daniel. God's enemies are just simply a foil to make him look good. Look, you, we're dealing today with different people, or sorry, different names, different faces, different situations, but they're the same people. And we have to see ourselves in this story. Who are you in the story? Who is this person in the story? Who is the other person in the story? You, you should read the story. You should read the world like you read Daniel. Because in the end, our death slaying, tyrant-destroying Christ stands over his grave, triumphing over the world in his great conquest to evangelize the nations. And he humbles the wicked. And so finally, I have to ask the question, are you on King Jesus' side? Are you on the side of the idol worshipers, the people who bow down to statues and created things and governments? All of these things bring tyranny, but it's only true religion, faith in Jesus Christ that brings liberty. And are you on King Jesus' side? Because he's only exalted all these other created things for the purpose of bringing them down low and showing how powerful he is and that he will receive his honor in the end. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this story, and we thank you for our King, Jesus Christ, and we pray our hearts would be raptured up in great visions of you, that you would cause us to bless you with our hearts, and that we would be sanctified, and our Lord Jesus would receive his honor, not just from us, but from all men everywhere. In Christ's name, amen.